Good morning. Good morning. Um, so my talk is about Monte Carlo assumptions, uh, not the fun kind of Monte Carlo where you go, the place you go to pretend to be James Bond. Um, <laughs> the risk isn't that your, I don't know, bomb pen is not going to actually blow up. Um, I'm looking at the other kind of Monte Carlo, so simulations. And Monte Carlos are a really useful um, tool to honestly do a lot of different aspects of um, analyzing the impact of risk. And it's really prominently used in, in financial planning. So it's used for um, all sorts of planning decisions regarding how much do I need to save, what asset allocation should I have, um, how much can I spend. And a whole list of other potential questions can be analyzed using Monte Carlo simulations. It is an absolutely critical tool for many. Um, so let's quickly review some of the assumptions around Monte Carlo, um, because it, there are assumptions that go into it. So when you have a Monte Carlo, basically you, oh, let's just say a very standard Monte Carlo, um, the user inputs some assumption about the mean and standard deviation of returns, and it will then draw returns from a normal distribution. Right? And here's just an example of one run of a Monte Carlo. That's my normal distribution there um, in the darker blue. And then for one run, you're not going to get something that looks really normal, um, but you're drawing a bunch of returns, simulating out the growth of wealth for however long you want. Um, but then as you run more and more simulations, you start to find a, the, your return distribution starts to look pretty normal. So this is just after 30 runs. We have now have 30 different portfolio outcomes. And the goal here is to, well, in this particular case, is to get a distribution of portfolio values here at the end. And that's how we could... Oh, can I do that? No, I can't. That's how we can quantify um, the impact of return risk on ending portfolio values. Now, there were a lot of different assumptions that I just made in this really simple Monte Carlo analysis, right? I assumed, first of all, that returns are normal. Second of all, that returns are independent. In other words, each draw of returns doesn't depend on draws that came before it. Um, and I also assume that the, these draws are all uh, identically distributed. So every single draw all, always comes from that very same normal distribution. The mean doesn't change through time. The volatility doesn't change through time. These are all questionable assumptions. And we know that, well, the economists in the room know that we always make assumptions. So we can't judge a model based on whether or not the assumptions are entirely true. Right. The question is, are the assumptions bad enough where they break the model? Or is this still a useful tool to simplify the world and just get at some of the main determinants of portfolio risk? So this is the question that I try and analyze. Um, things that we know, uh, let's look, things that we know um, are untrue, First of all, that returns are not necessarily normally distributed. Right? Um, this, we've known this for a very long time. Um, I'd say starting with Mandelbro Mandelbrot's work in the 60s, but all of a sudden this has really come to the forefront of many people's mind, um, just with this, now it has a fancy name attached to it, right? These are the black swans. So if we look at uh, return distributions, Here's what historical returns um, on a global equity index looks like. So here I'm taking uh, returns from the Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton uh, global returns database, and I just plot out a histogram. And we can see that you get some values out there in the tails that you wouldn't expect to see all too often under a normal distribution. You also get a lot more uh, observations clustered around the mean. So people tend to be pretty concerned with um, these events that we saw, for example, in 2008, where returns of less than 40%, you would only expect once every 520 years. Um, in, over the course of the last roughly century, we've seen this uh, twice. Of course, it's balanced on the other end. 
this guy up here where you saw an, one return um, that occurred in 1933 in excess of 70%, you wouldn't expect that. Uh, you'd only expect that once every 4,000 years. So we do have a lot of these extreme observations. Um, and the question is, do these break Monte Carlos? Um, is the output that comes out of it still useful, even if we just assume a normal distribution, which most simple Monte Carlos will do? So in order to explore this question, we can just run two, Monte Car or two simulations. We can, first of all, run a standard simulation where we're just drawing returns from this normal distribution, where that normal distribution is centered at the historical mean. I also use the historical standard deviation. But we can compare it to the results of a bootstrap simulation, where rather than drawing from the normal distribution, we are actually drawing from the historical distribution. Okay. What does that look like? Okay, again, we're going to just draw a whole bunch of portfolio paths, but rather than drawing from the smooth curve here, we're going to draw from the bars. Okay. Now, when we compare the two, um, here's what the histogram looks like on the left. On the right is the cumulative distribution, where I'm really focused in on that left tail. Because honestly, I think most people, when they run Monte Carlos, they're focused on that tail risk. And what do you see? Basically, the lines are on top of each other. I don't think that any of this fat tails and returns, at least to the extent that we've seen in the historical data, really does much at all to impact long-term return analysis using Monte Carlo. It's fine, apparently, to just assume a simple normal distribution. Um, you get uh, pretty much identical um, takeaways if, you were, if we were to use this, for example, to say, hey, I have an investor. He's, he's getting an inherent, inheritance today. And 30 years down the road, he's going to want a million bucks. Maybe he's going to, at that point in time, buy an annuity. How much does he need to save out of that inheritance today in order to get to that $1 million? And that's one place where you might use a Monte Carlo tool to analyze it. How much he needs to save today in order to make that million bucks with 75% success, 90% success, 95 or 99% success? is shown in this table here on the bottom left. And the numbers in our just plain, simple Monte Carlo versus the bootstrap are virtually identical. Right? So at least for this particular assumption, our returns normal. We know they are not. Doesn't matter. At least in this particular case, it doesn't appear to matter all that much. OK. Let's look at other um, assumptions that we know not to be true. It assumes that returns are IID, so independent, um, identically drawn. And we know that that's not the case. So for example, is the mean always going to be 10% every single year? When, we have, when we're in the depths of a recession with all of the uncertainty surrounding, for example, the financial crisis, do we think that the expected return on equities is different at that point in time? than whatever investors were expecting right before the crisis. Maybe not. There's plenty of evidence that shows that expected returns are time varying. They tend to be the highest at points where economic uncertainty is quite high. So what we analyze here, are how, how have average returns varied over the business cycle? Well, we see it. They tend to be the highest at the bottoms of recessions. Um, so what if we were to try and incorporate some of, some of this time-varying return? Um, other practitioners might look at this and say, hey, this is mean reversion. Right? Um, do we get some benefits from mean reversion? Or time diversification is another term that's often used. Now, how I try to analyze the impact of this is rather than bootstrapping one-year returns from the historical data, I bootstrap 10-year returns. In other words, I pick a random year, and then I follow that return for, the, for 10 years. I do that three times in order to build out the path for a, 30 year, for a portfolio for 30 years. My hope is that by drawing a 10-year return, 
I can capture any kind of mean reversion, any kind of time series correlation that might exist over a 10-year horizon. Let's look at the results. Okay, so what we'd expect if there was meaningful mean reversion is that the, the range of outcomes would become more narrow relative to an IID case. We do see this a little bit. So the darker blue is the case where my returns are drawn IID. The, the narrower range is where um, I'm bootstrapping 10-year returns. It's narrower, but not by a whole lot. So when you look at how much my guy would need to save in order to get a million bucks in 30 years, um, you don't really start to see meaningful differences in the tails unless you're looking at really the, the very, very tail. So you see that for 99% success, um, the Monte Carlo would say you need to save about 725000 Whereas if we did this bootstrap of 10 years, you would only need to save 450000 So that's a pretty meaningful difference. I don't know how many people are looking at that extreme tail because by the time you get to, say, um, the 75th percentile or even the 90th percentiles, those numbers tend to converge. Okay, so most practitioners that I talk to, they're using percentiles around the 80, well, somewhere between the 70 to 80% where by then you get pretty good convergence, where this idea, this notion that time diversification will save you clearly isn't the case. There's just not enough mean reversion, at least what we've seen in historical data, to be able to significantly reduce the range of long-term results. Okay, so what does matter? Um, what I find that is the most important assumption that we make in Monte Carlo analysis is that we know what the expected returns are. We clearly do not know what the expected returns are. Historically in the US, the equity premium has been about 8%. It's pretty high. Now, if you just extend the data in the US back to 1900, you get about a 1% reduction. The equity premium then is 7%. If you look globally, you find an equity premium of about 6%. And if you look at studies that try and estimate equity premiums from long-term growth in earnings or dividends, you get a much smaller number. Um, so what's the impact of this? This has a huge impact. So you can look at the numbers down in the table um, here, and you can see that, for example, if we have a guy that um, wants to save with 75% probability, um, and he's just using the historical average, he would need to put away about 150000 that range will be anywhere from 90,000 to 280, depending on what he's going to use as his equity premium assumption. That's a pretty big range. This assumption swamps all others. So what can you do to mitigate the uncertainty regarding expected returns? There's not a whole lot you can do within the framework of a Monte Carlo simulation. There you need to really use tools, for example, um, dynamic asset allocation strategies, dynamic saving strategies, things that incorporate more information about your return outcomes as you go along. So with that, looks like I'm out of time. Um, thank you very much.